hello everyone. Um, we're going to have Mircea Zetia talk to us, actually start an interactive session about managing technical debt. So questions are welcome, I believe. It's supposed to be interactive. So, By the way, this is the first time, the first interactive session ever done at any EuroPython. So, hey. Um, as uh, my colleague mentioned, this is the very first interactive session that is on EuroPython. I feel a little bit like a guinea pig, but that, that will pass. Uh, we should have a discussion here. That's what I understand. So I also have some slides. And we will see how, how this works. A few things about who I am. Um, I am technical manager at Spice. We're a small company located in Cluj, uh, Romania and we're doing mostly Python development work. Um, for those of you who wonder what a technical manager does, well, we are the people who pretend we can still write code. So that's mostly about it. The talk itself, it's about managing technical debt. Um, when I started the, thinking about the subject, I realized that is uh, pretty much like politics or religion. Everyone has an opinion, so that includes myself. So the more opinions, the better. And since I mentioned that this religion, we're going to start with a very beautiful impressionist picture. Um, our colleagues from classic paintings uh, named this uh, something around developers uh, asking forgiveness for technical debt at the beginning of a sprint. That pretty much describes it, to be honest. OK, uh, in summary, what we're going to try to do, we're going to try to define the purpose of the presentation, set the, set the stage. We're going to see some short history about the subject itself. Uh, we're going to see where exactly the technical debt occurs, at, what, at which levels, what are the consequences. Let's talk about interest, and also about the type of projects that um, where you actually care about technical debt. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but there are projects where you care more or you care less. All right. Um, first of all, since it's an interactive session, we have one hour. I would like to somehow limit the time for discussions per subject at about one or two minutes, depending on the interest. And by the way, seeing, at, seeing the lineup, what's uh, in parallel with this talk, there's really many sinners around here. So, OK. Uh, what is technical debt, first of all? It was first defined by Ward Cunningham, and it was defined in the early 90s as a metaphor, more or less, in terms of um, describing the extra development work when we choose easy, short-term solutions against longer-term um, or the proper way to implement stuff. It is a metaphor because it, it uh, relates directly to uh, the finance industry, to loans, and we're going to go and see what exactly is the debt and the interest that I mentioned earlier. Um, there are multiple ways. People have multiple opinions about what technical debt means and what it should mean, what it is. One of those people is Bob Martin. I'm sure you guys all heard about um, Robert Martin. Technically, he says that messy code is not really technical debt. That's just a mess. Now. Uh, Towards this purpose, he says that when you make a conscious decision about technical debt, what should happen is that you should try and write even cleaner code, have even cleaner interfaces, and so on. Does this work in real life? Why? Well, because people just do it in rush. They don't think this way. Yeah. So uh, the answer was that the people usually do it in a rush and don't think about stuff. That's partially true, I think, because when you make a decision that you're going to have technical debt and you're going to have to live with it, it's because you're, you, you, you have constraints. And usually those are time constraints. And the time constraint that's required to write uh, cleaner interfaces and so on, it sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. Now, next to that, we have Martin Fowler. And this is where... Uh, 
we have the discussion if we're talking about conscious and unconscious technical debt. His opinion is that the question if a mass is technical debt it's by itself is the wrong question. The idea is that you, you will have technical debt in the end. So it's more about defining the conscious approach and the unconscious approach. And he splits this into a, what he calls a, the technical debt quadrant. And I put it here. This is not mine, so it's copyrighted there. And we have the reckless technical debt and the prudent technical debt. And on the horizontal line, deliberate and inadvertent. OK, the reckless one for the deliberate one. We don't ha have time for design. Of course, what, it, uh, what I would like to mention is that uh, these guys are advocates for design patterns, refactoring, writing clean code, right? So design is, is there. The prudent approach for the, for the deliberate part is that we must ship and we have to deal with consequences. Now, how, how many of you here were in this situation? Okay. <laughs> I'll raise my hand as well. Uh, all right. For, for the uh, unconscious part, we have the first uh, part of the mess. What is layering? People do not really know what they are doing. Um, I saw autocomplete from Stack Overflow. Right. That might cause technical debt uh, in the end. The other part is actually very, very interesting. Now we know how we should, should have done it. Uh, Robert Martin, in a talk that he has, he says something like this. If you have a complex system that you haven't built before, you will know how to build it once you've built it. And it's not going to be the way you built it. So that is the, the other part. It's prudent. In the end, you do your best. Now, next part is why the quadrant, why did they approach it in this way, and what can we learn from these three statements? Yeah, and why calling it technical debt? Let's start with the last one. Why do you think they called it technical debt? Because you pay interest on it. Yeah, you pay interest in that. Correct. But why not say anti-patterns? It might look like the right time when, you, when you're doing it. Um, OK? It should be good if you're okay. doing it smartly. I think I'm going to use this for the recording. Yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes you can technically borrow strategically, because if you need to ship today, but, and you, you, if you don't ship today, for example, maybe you will not have funding to do anything anymore. Okay. So you can strategically borrow, and then it's not an anti pattern It's actually, if you, it's, it could be a good thing to do. But at the end of the day, what's the difference between technical debt and an anti-pattern? Baseline. You can try to avoid anti-patterns. You can try to avoid technical debt as well. Not always. Not always with anti-patterns also. Okay. <laughs> well, it's easier to discuss with business people. Because if you go to a business owner, someone who is a development manager or who doesn't really have his fingers into the development world, if you're going to him and say, OK, we have anti-patterns here, or we have any other kind of terminology, or whatever, it doesn't mean anything to, for them. It means, OK, it works. Why? Why change it? Why fix it? Technical debt, on the other hand, as you guys already said, directly relates to the finance part. So when you have a technical debt, you have two parts. You have the principal and you have the interest. This, they do understand. This we all understand, because we make a conscious decision to take a loan, right? And we know we have to pay off the principal, we have to pay off the interest. And all the, all the three approaches that I presented are ways that people unconsciously basically look towards advocating what, what they stand for. And yeah, this is the same, uh, the same with us. OK. In my opinion, technical debt is a status quo. It's there. It's either there or it isn't, and it's no real philosophy around it. it. 
it's not something that you might or you might not have. I used to um, describe this as more as a Schrodinger's cat problem. Before you acknowledge it, you, are, you both have it and you don't. But it's a matter of acknowledging technical that. So once you acknowledge it's there, it actually exists. So once you acknowledge it, yeah, don't live in denial. Now, um, questions or comments? Anyway. It depends how you, uh, the question is if there is any code that does not have technical debt. It depends how you look at it. It depends how you look at it, to be honest. Does it cause you problems later on? Did you make a conscious decision that um, you're gonna have it? Um, will you be able to cross that bridge once you're there? How, how well is your code tested? How clean are your interfaces? It, it, you, you cannot have something specific. And I would like to come back a little bit at uh, the purpose of the presentation. I don't have all the answers. I don't think I have all the questions. That's why we're here and was trying to have a discussion around it. But being the first session at the Europython that's interactive, we have a lack of uh, microphones also in the room. <laughs> so Rado is doing his best. Okay. At what level does technical debt occur? I already put that uh, up there. The first level that I see, it's at code level. And this is what, uh, what you mentioned. How does technical debt at code level manifest itself? Uh, for example, missing tests. Yes. Sorry. Missing tests, careless coding. Careless development, where you have to ship a feature as soon as possible, and you miss a lot of best practices, so spaghetti code. Okay. Very good. A framework that's, uh, that you depend on that becomes deprecated. Uh, the question is a little bit larger with the framework, because every f framework will solve parts of your problems. So when you choose a framework, it's also a type of technical that it will take you 80% of the way. It does depend how much you have to spend for the rest of the 20%. So that's uh, another approach. But let's say that you have, your code consists of something like 300 lines of code of uh, undocumented functions. So you have a func functions or methods that are, are like 300 lines of, lines of code. What is the technical debt that you, that you see there? Why? Why is that technical debt? Why the uh, documentation is missing? Yeah. Why is that techni technical debt? Because uh, in the future it will save you time when you go back to that code to understand it. Correct. It will save you time. So that's a debt. Something else. It endangers the, the readability and the, the way uh, it makes you more or less able to make decisions on this kind of code. And might drop it at some point or rewrite it because you don't understand it. Readability, okay. mostly. Okay, something else? Because uh, for money, if you have to outsource for external developers, because there is a lot of time more to understand and reading the APIs and stuff like that. That's true. Okay, how would you test meta, uh, an application that has, you know, functions or methods that are 300 lines of code long. You don't want tests in such code, right? No, okay. You do, but you don't, usually don't have them. Because people who write 300 line functions usually don't write tests. That's true. Okay, so people who uh, write 300 lines of uh, functions do not have tests. Okay. Uh, we have the principle defined here from our technical debt. Once as our colleague said, we're gonna have to go back and figure out every time that we have to change the code, we have to figure out what we wrote in there because we, it's undocumented. Uh, for this part, we have the interest that also a colleague here mentioned in regards that when you have to outsource to someone else, they will not understand the code. But how about uh, ourselves in, I don't know, three, six months time? 
uh, every time that you have to revisit that function, that is not, no longer technical debt, that is already interest. Every time that you have to onboard someone into an undocumented code, that's no longer technical debt, that, that is interest that you pay. Every time that you have to, uh, that you change the functionality within the test, within the function, the test will have to be updated. That is principle at one point, and the interest from that, from that point on. So this is one example of technical debt that can occur at code level. What's the impact? How would you, how would you, how would you see the impact at code level? Is it high? Is it low? High. high? I think it's the simplest thing to change. If you have broken API and a lot of code depends on it, yeah, that's true. But that is one step further about the broken APIs. We're talking about uh, technical debt at the architecture level. If you have broken APIs and you cannot maintain your code when you change it, that's, in, that's an architectural decision and you have technical debt at an architectural level. Now, at this point, I see two subdivisions. Application level, what you mentioned, infrastructure level. I worked on a project, and at, what, at a specific moment, I made a decision about the data model. And some colleagues here in the room already know it and had to live with the pain. Yeah, they're booing. <laughs> okay. That was the wrong decision. That was a decision that I had to take at an architectural level, and we paid a lot of Principal, we paid a lot of interest. People working on that application still pay the interest. Yes, Andre. Uh, that's a bad decision. Would I do it again? Probably not. Uh, right now, I'm working on an application with a similar problem, where I have the feeling that it might go the same way. I don't know how to fix it. It's still data model related. So, okay. What's the impact at the at the architecture level? Compared to the code level, if you mess up the architecture, what do you pay? You can't scale. You can't scale. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. It depends. What kind of scaling? How can you scale? Well, you can scale only horizontally, but you cannot adapt in other what, You cannot scale horizontally if your uh, architecture is broken, but can you scale vertically? Correct. I worked on an application where the only options were, was to scale uh, vertically because we did a lot of simulations, like tens of thousands of simulations, of electronic circuit simulations, and we, have this big, we had one big object that all the threads shared the same big object, and it was a mutually exclusive. Now, don't ask why that was not possible to have the distributed. It was a, another decision. Okay, but. Uh, going back a little bit, at the infrastructure level, how can you uh, have technical debt? On the application one, I have the same also entropy that you can't iterate. Mm -hmm. Too much. Okay. Manual setup, so the infrastructure. Manual setup at the infrastructure? Yeah. Correct. That's one thing. What if your application depends on local storage? stuff that's on your actual uh, application instance, when you have to scale, uh, scale up. Yes, and you have to share the same file system or you have to have a distributed storage and so on. It's the same with databases. Okay. The next level is at the specification level. These are, this is what uh, I think what I think. Why is it important to, or why do I think that's, uh, why do I think, why is it important to have the specification level um, sorted out, or the specs sorted out? What kind of technical debt results from specifications? It can prevent you from finding actual good solutions in the future if the specification just says it has to be this way and no one's thought about it, for example. Yeah. It really does prevent you to finding the best solution. It has automatically impact on the architecture level, on what do you decide that you do and how do you do it. So once 
you have a, a set of specifications, make sure you clarify them. Because if you don't know what you're doing properly, the results can uh, bubble up. OK, we talked a little bit about interest. Uh, we touched, touched the subject uh, before. So at all levels that we discussed, we have to pay the interest. We saw that at code level, the, the amount of interest that we have to pay is relatively low. As we go up to architecture and specifications, we're going to pay more and more interest. Every bad decision that we make at the architecture level will have a snowball effect. Now, one problem that we have while we manage the technical debt is that project manager, product owners, business owners will want to know how can you measure technical debt? How can you measure the interest? Why is this so large? How can, can, how can we measure the interest? Because when we have a finance loan, okay, we have the principal and we have the interest. We know exactly the amount of money that we have to uh, put back. Can we do this in software? I would suggest that it just you would notice that it gets slower and slower to ship features. That's the worst thing. As time goes on, a year later, two years later, it's slower and slower to implement new features. You cannot, it's true, you cannot predict. You cannot say from the start when you say, okay, I acknowledge that I have technical debt. You cannot say what exactly will be the interest of this debt. But as time goes by, it is easier and easier uh, for people to see, okay, I have to fix something. It takes a lot of time. Uh, when I fix it, the application will break probably in 10 other places. Usually, technical debt makes your system both rigid and fragile. When you have this, it's not open to change, and you can uh, everything that you deliver, be it new features or bug fixes, take longer and longer. That's one way to measure it. The important thing is that every time that you have this, you probably should discuss with. Uh, the people who own it, because you're going to have questions. Why is this simple fix take so long? Why, why does it take so long to have this simple fi fix uh, shipped? Why does it take so long to have this fixed uh, issue and have it deployed on a production environment? Because our infrastructure is not ready, or we have to do manual stuff. Uh, just a question. Isn't that like too late? I mean, if you've already gotten to the point where features take so long to implement, it, aren't we just now realizing that it's technical debt that's from two years ago? It's a matter of acknowledging it. If it takes two years for us to realize that this is technical debt, then we did something wrong at some point. Usually, technical, you can notice technical debt a lot earlier than that. But probably it was not communicated. Uh, properly in the timeline. Or it simply wasn't technical debt at the time. So if it really takes you two years to figure out that it was a bad decision or you know bad thing to do, it, um, then it was might, might actually have been the right thing to do at the time. But the requirements changed uh, during the last two years. That is correct. The requirements changed during the last two years. Yep. Or the environment changed. Yeah. That too. Cool. We can have more of this. OK, one question. Who's responsible for technical debt? Everyone. OK, when? OK, as soon as it's acknowledged. What does it mean that something is everyone's responsibility in a team? <laughs> Nobody will do it. <laughs> exactly. OK, however, you are correct. Technical debt is everyone's responsibility. And when you encounter it, the least that you can do is communicate it. The least that we can do is communicate it. The least we can do is start discussion, discussion, discussing around it. OK. Now, some things that I think that would have some impact on preventing. Search. If you're building something and you don't know how to build it, search for it. If you didn't find the proper solution, ask for help. I encountered the lack of asking for help in numerous occasions. 
and it does lead to technical debt. It has nothing to do with, I don't know, pride or ego, because in a team, we're all trying to achieve the same thing. Uh, pocket, what, uh, POC, that's uh, proof of concept. If you don't know how to do it, create a proof of concept, okay? And that's the line that I uh, put previously. Diligence, do the bare minimum that will allow you to scale at the infrastructure level. Make sure that you have clean interfaces, your communication interfaces are correct. Be aware of how you're gonna scale, how you, will you have to scale, if it's going to have to be horizontal or vertical. It really does depend on your application profile. At the specification level, the very first thing is communication. If you do not have communication, you will not be able to fix technical debt, ever. Communicate, make sure that you communicate properly. Uh, be aware of what, of how you, you can, and you have to communicate with non-technical people. The second line is, well, when we work on projects, when we start a project, usually we have a few, a few steps. That's POC, POV, and MVP. Do you guys know the difference between these three things? POV, proof of value. Proof of value. Well, think about the fact that you're building an application, you, you own an application, you want to build one. But you are, the market that you're entering is not exactly mature or there is no reference to what you are doing. Okay? You want to be sure that before you start building it and releasing it, you can prove yourself. Now, this is done in, in, in a number of ways. You can, from simple mockups, clickable mockups, that will demonstrate uh, the value for uh, stakeholders or for investors, to having an actual application that works, and then you can do something like live testing, that you interact with your user. You analyze and decide if you're moving forward or not. It's very important that you uh, know the proof of concept, proof of value, and the MVP. Do not let yourselves uh, pulled in into a discussion, something like this is a proof of concept that ends up in production. <laughs> who, who saw this? <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> okay. And yeah. What's Minimum viable product. Yes. Exactly. And do not make assumptions. And this is, uh, yeah, the famous last words are, what could possibly go wrong? Okay. Now, what to do when you actually have technical debt? The very first step is to identify it, at least in my opinion. Um, next, know the exact problem, <coughs> communicate it, and make sure you translate this to cost. Every time you want to fix something, it's cost. It costs money, right? Uh, make sure of the cost, not only from uh, the money perspective, but also of the, from the impact of the change that you're doing. If you don't have clean interfaces, if uh, the code that you wrote is used, in numerous applications, make sure that you keep your, keep your interfaces. Okay, and you can sustain them. Okay, again, communication. And from the communication part, what results or should result, it would be a plan to pay out the debt. And this is a discussion, sometimes when you build something and it's wrong, you also have a lot of code that's built on top of it. So it's a decision that you, you have to see if you have to pay the principal part, the actual bad implementation, and, or also the interest, and which comes first. Do you have to fix the code that relies on a bad implementation, or you have to fix the bad implementation first? How would you approach it? Fix the code first, why? It's a dependency. 
Correct. When you change the core part, it's, it's going to break everything. You will have to fix everything else. So uh, it was you have you can be smart about it, uh, fix the interfaces, and keep the part uh, the bad part for later on, right? Okay, yeah. Now collaboration. Uh, yeah. As we discussed already, it's everyone's responsibility. We're all a team. It's our responsibility to fix it. Collaborate. But when I'm uh, discussing about it's all of us as, a, as responsibles for the code and for the technical debt and for fixing it, I'm not only discussing about the technical team. It has to be a collaboration with product and so on. We're all the team. We're all a team. You have to have timelines. You have to have a plan and say, okay, this is how we're going to fix it. This is how the paying, off the technical, paying off the technical debt and the interest fits within uh, our timelines, our deadlines, and so on. And this is actually the last part of the presentation. Did you guys ever hear uh, something like, I don't care about technical debt? Mm -hmm. Literally, like this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did you guys hear something like, this is a problem we acknowledge as we're going to fix it later? Yes. Okay. Sometimes. What's the context when you hear this? Sorry? True, business guys usually. But the, the thing that I saw was that there is a difference between companies and business guys. Companies that live out of delivering software are more interested or should be more interested in paying off, paying off technical debt. This does not necessarily, is not necessarily true for companies for which software is a helper to their business. It helps develop things. For them, for the, for, for the second uh, type of companies, having manual tweaks for two, three, five, six, ten releases, having someone actually doing something that can be automated, for instance, it's acceptable. Pushing it to fix it might not be the right solution. It's a business decision in the end. However, if what you do is actually software delivery, and if, if you live out of software, that's, that's your core business, then technical debt is something that you're certainly interested in and should be interested in more than anything else. The, the, the question was, what about op the usage of open source software within applications where you have the technical debt? How can you mitigate uh, what, you, what you get, actually? Because you get, you get it for free. First of all, know what you're using. And try to know the, the library, the application, or the open source project that you are using. Know its limitations, know its boundaries. This is something that you do at the beginning of a project if you can. If you do not do this part of analysis, if you don't take time, it's very likely that at some point you will end up with a lot of technical debt. One thing that I think you can mitigate is once you know what the technical debt is within that project, is try to have an abstraction layer and communicate with your own interfaces for the stuff that you need, if that is possible. That would be one solution. If you guys see other solutions. Well, one thing I had to do was actually go in and 
fix bugs in open source projects we were using because it, that open source project, since it's the core of my product now, in a way, it's also my code. So yeah. when I'm using it, I'm, it's part of my technical debt. So I have to fix it. Correct. And once you fix it, create a pull request, push it mainstream. Don't, don't keep it for yourself. <coughs> it might or might not get integrated depending on how active the project is. Anything else? Any other questions? Just one second. And for freelancer or contractors, um, how they should deal with technical debt when clients doesn't want to, to pay more for fixing bugs that may be dangerous for him, for his project? How do you think we should handle that when we are freelancers? You have to have a, uh, a very clean way of explaining the technical debt to your customer. You have to be able to uh, have an argument, why does this take as long as it takes? Why, why do you have to fix it? He has to see the fact that not fixing this will cost him this much, this much immediately and this much in the long run. Usually it's very hard if you're a freelance developer to make this argument at the very beginning of a project. First thing that you have to do is earn trust. And uh, even though some people say that, okay, I'm outsourcing your project, I trust you by default, that is rarely the case. Trust is something that you earn and not get by default. Once the client gets to trust you and see, sees the result, the results of your work, it's gonna be easier and easier for you to discuss these kind of issues with, you, with, you, with him. So it's merely a communication problem and a, uh, trust issue. Sir? Going back to the previous one, how do you measure the actual cost of the cost? How do I take my technical debt and. So how do I get a dollar measure of my technical debt? You translate it in time, in time spent. And for this, you have to have historical data. So you actually say we should measure the cost of fixing bugs and so forth? Yes, because yeah. you, you have to lock the time somewhere, right? And you have to see, okay, this is a simple fix. Why, do, what, why did it take so long to have it done? Why did it take so long to have it shipped? This translates to cost in terms of uh, dollars immediately. A research paper here and there uh, talking about how they perhaps tried to measure technical debt and I'm really interested how come that we as a devel uh, developer community and uh, freelancers and a lot of us are uh, living out of this don't have like some tool that we could you know just run on a code base and we could get things like hey um, there is some um, technical depth in that file, that file, and that, and that file. I mean, you can already do that, but there are some other metrics and you have to be smart about it. How would you implement such a tool? Um, yeah, so, good question. <laughs> yeah, exactly so that. The, the thing is really, uh, you can have indications for technical depth. But uh, there's nothing that really tells you, like there's no autom automatism that allows you to say there's technical debt in there. Because um, as if you, especially given the sentence up there, translate to cost, right? Um, there's no direct translation from something you find somehow in code to the cost it takes to fix it. Uh, the cost may actually be zero um, in some cases because you can, you can sometimes say, um, okay, this is, this is not done the right way, so it, it might cost us something to fix it, but not fixing it is actually okay, right? Because we are not, uh, we, we are not seeing anything in the future that might force us into fixing it. Yeah. Okay? Uh, this is, one, uh, this is a, an example that is very good, for instance, in the banking industry. Some of, some of the banking industry actually has mainframes that still run on COBOL. No one's gonna fix that code. 
they are going to maintain it, they are going to build in, uh, interfaces around it, and they have people who maintain it. It costs too much to have it fixed, for instance. Yeah, because sometimes you get in a situation when actually paying interest uh, is the best option, because fixing is more expensive. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just a comment that sometimes you have situations when paying interest is the best business decision for you because fixing it is too expensive and maybe the project is ending soon and you won't be changing this code. You just pay the interest until the end. It's, f it's fine. It's cheaper. Yeah, and if you have, uh, if you have technical debt that's isolated in a module, <laughs> you have your interfaces well defined, it does the job. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I just want to uh, add to the question about why don't we have a tool that can just tell you there's a technical debt of this time of or this money. There actually are tools that can tell you that. If you look, for example, at SonarCube, you can specify a cost of different uh, code violations and it will calculate it in dollars or time. It basically goes through your code, finds all the violations that you specify you want to look into, and just sums it up. Uh, it's actually a pretty good tool, a uh, pretty good tool if, for example, you have uh, some legacy application and you are building a new feature. It's so huge you simply cannot eliminate the technical debt from the whole application. You just You just know that this one new feature, you will be working on it all the time. So you want to eliminate as much technical depth from that code you are building right now. So it can actually tell you uh, what's the difference you know, from the rest of the application. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff you can specify, but there are tools to do that. Uh, one thing that uh, is in regards to tools, they are going to measure your code quality. Uh, you can, that, that's the first thing that, that's the first step, right? You can automate and see, okay, I have these lines of code, I have undocumented code, I know this, I have so much responsibilities here, I have this, this, and that. How do you measure technical debt when, you're, it, when it occurs at an architecture level yeah, or at a specification yeah, level? So for basic stuff, yes, you can use tools. It might or might not translate to cost. On the other hand, who's going to fix the technical debt? Uh, within a team, we, have, we are all developing on different, uh, different levels. It takes more or less time depending on who implements it, depending on the experience of uh, the person who implements it. It's not something that is out of the box. You have it out of the box, and everyone does it the same way. Um, you, the plan to pay out the debt, uh, you didn't exactly detail how uh, do we pay uh, technical debt to uh, remove it. So uh, refactoring or uh, rewriting an application from scratch. Uh, uh, which, uh, how, can you, can, how can we measure when we should do one or the another at which point? Actually, actually, I did. What I mentioned there, but I didn't explain it, was all about communication and timelines and deadlines. The decision if you're going to pay in, uh, the technical debt and the, and the interest incrementally is a business decision. It's not a technical decision, unless your code is completely unmaintainable and you're not able to write anything in that code. Then the correct decision is to rewrite it. But even then, you're going to have situations when the decision is going to be we're gon not going to rewrite it, we're going to uh, rewrite it incrementally. So it's not something that you can say as a rule when you're doing this and when, when you're doing that. When you decide to rewrite it, when you decide to uh, fix it incrementally. Think about this. A software piece usually uh, is maintained, developed for five years, uh, actually uh, actively developed, and after five years you get into maintenance mode. So that's the technically the time frame for a, for a software piece, depending on the industry that you, that you work in. You cannot just rewrite a piece of code that is one year old. I mean, it's not necessarily the best, the best decision, unless you messed up at the specification level and the specifications were completely wrong. But then you have the proof of value 
that should have validated this in terms of business. We got 10 minutes. We have uh, 10 I have minutes. a question. Um, is anyone here a fan of the Boy Scout rule? I mean, that's one of the things I like to do when I get to a piece of ugly code. I need to work on it. I also fix whatever's ugly. I mean, um, personally, I like to do touch-as-you-go refactoring. I think if you get to the point where you need to go back and refactor something after a long time, it's probably so costly that you won't do it, so maybe try to do a bit of refactoring every time you develop. Is anyone else a fan of that? On the Boy Scout rule, I think it's important that you separate the code cleanup from the actual functional changes. That's all. But other than that, I mean, every time you see crap, pick it up, throw it away. Right. There as well. At first, I was a little skeptic about this rule, and I didn't believe that. But for example, our entire test suite for um, functional testing in web browser at first, it was very messy, and nobody wanted to touch that. But we started, uh, this was our first internal project when we started using this rule. And after about half a year later, it was in much better design. It was uh, slowly re-implemented, and uh, every time we uh, changed something, we tried to uh, additionally fix a, a little the, the tests. Uh, there, there were other parts of our system which were bad designed and uh, the, the rule um, worked also. So I can recommend it. And at first, uh, don't be afraid of it. This, is, this will work in time, but it requires much more, much more time than we can imagine at first, just to sit and rewrite it. It will take lo much longer. That's uh, one way to put it. So it's about approaching uh, legacy application. The application when you cannot get rid of that, it's about uh, writing clean code and make sure that you don't have uh, that you don't trigger old bugs. Well, my question is, how do you enter a new project? And this might also <coughs> excuse me. This might also be a solution for dealing with legacy applications. When you uh, ramp up on a project that's already being developed, one of the best ways to ramp up is to uh, add unit tests or add testing. When you have a legacy application, this also might be a good solution to see where your problems are. Because there are, I see two parts in what you described. One is writing your code that is clean and nice and neat. And the other part is actually uh, making sure that you do not have re uh, bugs, regressions, and so on. So you don't break anything that's already there. In order to be able to develop with a certain degree of certainty, you have to have at least the basic flows of an application tested. Be it unit tests, be it integration tests, be it whatever, if it's, a, if it's a web application, I don't know, UI, Selenium tests, you have to have a certain degree of testing that will validate that what you built is the good solution. At least it doesn't break anything else. But this is one approach that I would take. Work on the tests, add more tests, set up a continuous integration system, for instance, for that, if it's not already there. I think it's really important, too, that you have good code review that uh, within a team, you know, you, uh, you agree upon certain standards and, yeah, people look at your code, give feedback, things like that. Absolutely. Good code reviews are, uh, are very important. Now, there are two types of code reviews. Don't try to code review something that can be automated. Don't try to have, I don't know, PEP uh, stuff, pilot and so on in, within code reviews. Use an automated tool for that. The problem with code reviews is that, uh, well, you know, you have 30 lines of code, 
whoever reviews it will say, will find probably 10 or 15 issues. You have a, you have a pull request for 500 lines of code, the comment will be, looks good to me. <laughs> so make sure that this is also enforced. Don't have large pull requests, do it incrementally. Split, uh, split uh, things up in such a way that will allow you to have small, smaller pull requests. It's not always possible. When, we, when you, you know you submitted 500 lines of code and it says, look, it looks good to me, okay, review it again, please. <laughs> I would like to make sure that this is actually uh, okay. Because when you look at the code, you do a, a code review on, a, on the code base. Also, I think it's important to f within the code review process to follow the requirements that led to that code change. Make sure that it also fits the business value or the part where um, the description, the requirement itself. And this brings up another discussion when you have requirements and probably if you're working agile you will have user stories. Make sure that you have, always have the three parts of a user story. As someone, I want to do something because that will allow you to have at least to start a discussion around the best solution for, for the problem. I wanted to stress out also in the team and communication part that sometimes, or maybe too often, we overlook the infrastructure level technical depth and code people always tend to think uh, that they have to deal with uh, this type of database because it's there uh, instead of just maybe trying to discuss with the ops guys and tell them maybe Postgres would fit better on my, on, my, uh, on my pattern and would allow me to avoid this kind of technical depth. That, that's absolutely... Exactly. Be, be the ops guys. So, uh, very often uh, teams are split between de development team and operations team. Okay, there are two pains here. One is the operation team who has to uh, deploy your code and the development team who has to deal with the constraints that come from the operations team. If you do not have the communication between these teams, if you have split teams, it's a very hard path. On the other hand, you as developers, I as, de as a developer, should live with the pain of deploying what I wrote. Right? Everyone should live with that pain. Not only the ops guys. And on the other hand, possibly also the ops guys should live with some constraints of uh, the application that we build. That's the only way to go. So be the ops guys. Try to be part of that ops, ops team. See what they have to deal with. Maybe it will allow you to better see why you have some constraints and some uh, limitations within the project or within the teams. But indeed, Postgres is the better solution compared to MySQL, for instance. Um, also, how to avoid um, technical debt by using techniques like um, um, pair, pair programming with uh, your team or um, uh, like you said, reading small pull requests and reviewing them. How do you, what is your take? Per programming versus small pull request? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, what are the techniques uh, to avoid technical debt? It depends on how your organization is set up. If you can do per programming, do extreme programming, that's okay. Okay, yeah. So it depends on the context. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily something that you enforce. Sorry? Uh, yes, I think we still have a couple of minutes. If I have? Sorry. Pair people up who uh, have uh, different uh, level of skills. That will that would be one thing that, uh, that I would do. Uh, having an extra pair of eyes is always useful, but in this way you also grow your team. Um, 
I think it's, it makes sense to pair up a more junior programmer with a more senior uh, developer. And uh, it also might make sense to have the more junior person typing so the senior cannot like step over the junior like, I'm just gonna type this up real quick and yep. the junior doesn't get, get what's being made. Absolutely, That's and one, one thing that was suggested to me in a team that I worked uh, before was actually have junior people review senior people's code for instance, but that's different from pair programming. Both, both people involved in pair programming should follow uh, the business rules. That's, you have to make sure of that. Besides that, uh, if you have automation for everything that's code-based related, you should end up with the best solution from that construction. Sorry. So you mentioned the Boy Scout rule. Um, and I had some great success, I think, with that, because I ended up uh, basically with my first really big hobby Python project. Uh, I ended up with like 20,000 lines of codes, almost without tests. So quite some technical depth. And um, that running on like different platforms and so was kind of a pain. So I started to um, write tests and then have a script um, with coverage.py, where I uh, have a list of perfect files, so files with 100% coverage. And for those files, the coverage may never decrease because it was too early to enforce uh, coverage always increasing because there are just some things which are not testable yet. So that's what I did and what worked out very well for me. Yeah, that's one way to, to set it up. But on the other hand, don't rely on coverage, would be my take. Because coverage also depends on how you write the test. Having 100% code coverage is not necessarily a goal. It's having your business uh, properly tested. That should be your goal. It might be 60%, it might be 80%. Some things might not be worth testing. At least that's my personal opinion. I know there are people who say, okay, well, we have to have Full system tests, full tests, but some not, it's not always possible. If you write an open source library and people rely on that, and yes, your coverage should be as high as possible because other people rely on your code. Within your project, it's also a business decision, or an, not necessarily a business decision, but an educated decision. Have your main flows tested, have your uh, positive negative flows tested, but first of all, make sure that your code is actually testable. Input, processing, output. Single responsibility principle, and so on. Solid stuff. Um, a new project for making a new project uh, easier to test, it would, be, would, it, uh, would it be uh, smart or um, uh, educated to adapt um, service-orientated uh, architecture? Or, uh, if, if it fits your requirements and if it fits your project, sure, hmm. you can use a saw. I, I mean, uh, do you have arch architect architecture which are um, very difficult to test and which becomes a bad decision? Or not. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. Well, again, the answer is it depends. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've seen projects that are a monolith and people started, wanted to split them up within microservices and the reason behind it was that it, was, it, it would be easier to deploy. If you can't deploy a monolith, you will not be able to deploy and maintain microservices. So it depends. Do we still have time? Um, so officially, no. We're supposed to end about two minutes ago, but uh, the coffee break starts in 15 minutes. I think we can, um, whoever wants to pop out and the rest of us want to just continue some questions and some discussions, we can just gather at the front and just chat some more. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Oh. I, I had one more, one more slide, actually. This is when, what happens when you try to fix that little bug in a uh, fragile and rigid environment. <laughs> okay, thanks guys. <laughs>